Today, I'm going to show you why type hints in Python are useful. And it's not for the reason you think. Sure, they help with catching type errors early, but the biggest benefit is actually something else. And that also leads to a very interesting property of types that really surprised me. More about that in a minute. First, let's take a quick look at where type hints came from and how to add them to your code. Type hints were introduced in Python 3.5 back in 2015 through PEP 484. I've talked about that PEP before in my videos. Python is dynamically typed, which makes it flexible. It also means it's easy to pass the wrong type and only discover it at a runtime. The idea behind type hints is to provide optional typing to help with code clarity and tooling support without forcing Python to be statically typed like Java or C++. Since then, type hints have evolved significantly. Python 3.9 introduced built-in generics, lowercase, list, and dict, etc., instead of the uppercase, list, dict from typing. Python 3.10 brought type alias and improved type inference. Python 3.12 introduced a new generic syntax. But again, real power is not what most people think. So let's look at an example. I'm going to start with a very simple function that calculates a discount for a list of item prices. And this is what it looks like. As you can see, there is no type hints here at all. Like I said, it's not required in Python, even though I have all these little red squiggly lines because I have my typing set to strict in VS Code. But actually, when I run this code, this works perfectly fine because Python ignores type hints at runtime. So this works, but what exactly is items? Is that a list, a tuple? A generator and discounts. What is that? You can probably figure that out by analyzing the body. But in general, without type hints, you have no idea. And what does it return? Well, we also have to look into the body to figure out what it actually returns. And this is, of course, a very basic function. But in case a function is longer, more complex, well, then it's going to be really painful that you have to look into the body of the function every time to figure out what kind of thing it expects and what it returns. So, Let's add some type hints here. Let's say items is a list of floats, like so. And for the discount, we can also define that. God, I need to learn how to type. We can also define that as a float. And then you see that Copilot already suggests the correct return type for me. So here, now items is a list of floats, which is great. Now it's much clearer what it does. And that's also something where type hints help already, right? You understand better what your data structures are. So here I changed this to a list of float, but now you see that there's an issue that items is actually integer. So there's a mismatch. So we can either change the type or we can change the values depending on what you actually need in your code, right? So let's run this. And of course we didn't really change the code in any way, so this still works correctly. Now the thing is that in this particular approach, there is actually still something missing. I've explicitly defined items as a list of floats. However, you might wonder why should we limit this to a list? What if somebody wants to pass a tuple or a set or even a generator? So a more flexible approach in this case is that you actually use an iterable instead. And that we're going to need to import from collections.abc. And then instead of making this a list, we're making this an iterable. Now, we still have the same code right here in my main function. There is no issue whatsoever. If I run this, of course, this works exactly in the same way. But now, if I want to, I can change this into a different kind of data structure, like so. And I can save this, and now this also works without any issue. And not just that, I can also turn this into a tuple, and that's also going to work just fine. In fact, I can even use a generator, like so. And now this also works. In other words, it's the same function, but we get way more flexibility, all because type hints made us think about our data structures. And this is actually the real power of type hints. They don't just tell you how to use a function, they actually make you think how it should be designed. And that can actually lead to a better design of your code. For example, because of this change, moving from a simple list to an iterable, 
you might redesign an order class to change from a list of line items to a set so you can avoid double occurrences of items. Or perhaps you want to retrieve these items dynamically using a generator from the database and then use calculate discount in that way. It all changes how you design your code. And the reason you figure that out is because you thought more about your code in generic terms. And that is the biggest benefit. Now, if you want to improve your ability in general to spot design problems like this in Python code, check out my free code diagnosis workshop. I'll teach you how to review code, quickly detect problems. Sign up at arn.code slash diagnosis. The link is also in the description. So one thing you can conclude from this example is that you want your inputs to be as generic as possible. If we would have stuck with a list of floats, we would have unnecessarily restricted the function. Using iterable means that it can accept lists, tuples, generators, any other iterable. In type theory, you would say that these inputs are contravariant. They accept a wider range of types. Let's take a look at another example. Imagine you're building a reporting system where data can be exported in multiple formats. So here I have an example of some code that does that. In fact, this just has a JSON exporter and there is a function to generate a report. So that function gets a specific exporter as an argument. In this case, that's a JSON exporter. Now the problem with this approach is that generate report only can work with a JSON exporter. Let's actually also run this and see what happens. So it actually exports it in a JSON format. But let's say we want to create a new class called a CSV exporter. And there it also has an export method, but then it actually joins things by uh, commas. So now the problem is I need to refactor generate report to also work with the CSV exporter, which is not very flexible. It violates the open closed principle on top of that. It means it's very easy to now create a CSV exporter that is slightly different from the JSON exporter by, I don't know, using another method name or uh, organizing the arguments differently. And that means it just leads to code that is basically easier to complicate. And we want things to be simple. Now, a better way to approach this is to actually use an abstraction like an abstract base class or a protocol. So I'm going to use a protocol in this case. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an exporter class. And this is going to have a single method called export. And generate report is going to expect an exporter instead of a JSON exporter. And now what I can do is I can actually generate a CSV exporter here. I don't need to change anything in generate report because it accepts any exporter. And then I can simply run this and then I'm going to get my data in CSV format. In other words, this is way more flexible. I can add more exporters here without having to do anything in this part of my code. So it's more flexible, more maintainable, overall just a better design of the software. Well, and this is another example of making sure that your input types are generic. So instead of having a specific JSON exporter, which limits me, I'm now using an exporter, which is more generic and accepts any type of export. Now, interestingly, for return types, it's actually the other way around. You should be as specific as possible. Let's say we have a function that computes a discount per item. So that's very similar to the first example I had, except it does it for all the items separately. So we have my uh, items, which is a nice generic iterable, like we talked about before. We have a discount, and then I'm returning a list of items where I apply the discount to each item separately. Now what I've done here is that I've also made the return type generic, basically following the same procedure as for the arguments, right? Now, in principle, this works, but there is also a problem. This iterable is actually too broad. And even though the function actually returns a list, in my main function, it treats discounted items as an iterable of floats. And this means that actually you won't have access to list specific things, such as the length. Like if I try to print the length of discounted items here, you see I now get a type issue because there is actually no len donder method. Whereas actually when I run this, this will actually run totally fine because it is actually a list and Python simply ignores these type hints at runtime. So the fix is that you need to be more specific in your return type. So instead of making this an iterable, you should actually make this a list because that is actually what it returns. And now also this type error that we got here is gone. 
And let me run this one more time. You see that it does exactly the same. So as I mentioned before, inputs should be as wide as possible, as generic as possible, contravariant. Outputs should be covariant. In other words, as specific as possible. Now, before I show you a final example, give this video a like if you're enjoying it so far and subscribe to the channel. It's a small thing, but it really helps me a lot if you do that. Let's look at another example where the return type is too generic and that causes issues. Imagine that we're designing a system that interacts with a database. So I have my database connection class here, which is a protocol. So that's, let's say, an interface for connecting with the database. And then you might have different types of databases that follow this particular protocol. A specific one that I have here is a Postgres database that has at least these methods. So it follows this protocol. Then I have a separate function that's called connect to DB that creates a database connection. In this case, it creates a Postgres connection. The return type is generic. It's a database connection. And then basically I use this in my main function to execute some SQL query. Again, not for real, it's just an example. When I run this code, this is what happens. So it works perfectly fine, right? But here's the problem. This function, connect to DB, claims to return a database connection protocol, but it hides the fact that it's actually a Postgres connection. The caller of this function loses access to any Postgres specific features, like, for example, this method, start transaction, that is not in the protocol. So if I try to call this method here, like so, you see that we actually get a type error. So what's the solution in this case? Just like the previous example, we have to be specific. So instead of returning a protocol, we are actually returning something of type Postgres connection. And we're specific about that. And now also the typing issue here is again gone. What I've shown you today is that type hints are more than just documentation or help you avoid type issues. They do something really important. They make you think really carefully about your data structures and help you come up with better more generic design. And a really good practice in approaching how to use type hints effectively is by thinking about the idea that inputs should be as generic as possible and outputs should be as specific as possible. That's really, for me at least, the guiding principle that I use when I think about types and when I think about how I organize my code and how everything communicates. But I'd like to hear from you. Are you using type hints? I sincerely hope so. And what do you think makes them useful? And did you know about this idea of generic inputs and specific outputs? Let me know in the comments. If you want to go beyond the basics with type hints in Python, you need to learn how to use generics. They're very useful. Like I mentioned, since Python 3.12, there's new syntax, which makes them really easy to use. And to learn all about that, watch this video next. Thanks for watching and see you next time.